Time to re YouTube, your boy Young Mustard is back with another video. You know, over the course of NBA history, we have had numerous players that have been labeled as quote unquote frauds or overrated, you could say. And a specific award that many people point to to see certain frauds is the MVP winner. Players like Russell Westbrook or Derrick Rose, winners now in hindsight years later, many people share the opinion that they were not deserving recipients. And I think that those questions about those two in particular are are more than valid, especially in the case of Derrick Rose winning over LeBron James and Dwight Howard. But there's one player in NBA history whose legacy is always in question consistently because of his back-to-back -back MVP status. And when you really take a step back and look at his career, especially in the years that he won the MVP award, it's kind of crazy the amount of disrespect that this player gets. And obviously, as you guys can tell from the title, I am talking about Steve Nash. Nash is looked at in many circles as an over overrated player that had no business winning back-to-back -back MVPs in a league that had Shaq, Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, LeBron James, and numerous other players at elite levels. I mean, some people even go as far as to say that Steve Nash would not even be a Hall of Famer had it not been for his head coach Mike D'Antoni implementing the seven seconds or less offense that launched Steve Nash and the Phoenix Suns into the stratosphere of offensive excellence, becoming one of the most historic teams on that side of the ball. And though there definitely is some truth to the criticism around Steve Nash, I believe a lot of it is completely overstated and it's gone to the point where Steve Nash is now underrated in those circles. So today we're going to have a conversation about just how great was Steve Nash and why he is the most disrespected MVP in NBA history. But before we go any further, make sure you guys drop a like on this video. It goes a long way. What also goes a long way is subscribing to the channel because I am almost at 100,000 subscribers. I'm going to be hitting 87K soon. Hopefully by the end of the year, we hit that 100K mark, but I can't do it without your help and if you enjoy this video don't only hit that subscribe button but that bell as well for post notifications without further ado though let's talk about one of the greatest offensive players in the history of this league steve nash before we continue with this video, I want to give a shout out to today's sponsors, Private Internet Access. When you're on the internet with the unprotected device like a phone, computer, laptop, that said device is transmitting a great amount of information that can be viewed by multiple different entities at once, even before you reach your desired destination on the internet. A virtual private network, or VPN for short, hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. That way, it'll shield your digital life from the eyes of those trying to get inside from the outside. You are always at risk of having your identity stolen through the internet. Hackers are always using these same Wi-Fi platforms and they have the ability to steal your personal data, passwords, and they can even access your photos through that. Private internet access will protect your data by encrypting your internet connection through their world-class server and infrastructure and makes your information shielded and bulletproof. Private internet access also allows you to access region restricted content from all over the world. Whether you're trying to watch NBA games on League Pass anywhere in the world, or you're trying to watch Atlanta on Netflix because unfortunately it's blocked in the US, all you have to do is connect to their VPN on any of the US 50 state servers and you're covered immediately. Another thing about it that I love is that it allows you to protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. Using the internet without PIA is like boxing without protective gear. It only takes one hit to break your jaw. And to help you avoid that broken jaw, check out the link in the description box, pinned comment, and on the screen right now to have access to 83% off on your order. That's $2.03 a month along with four months free. Once again, shout out to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. Now, I won't lie, I used to be a big proponent of the Mike D'Antoni made Steve Nash conversation. I mean, when you look at the point guards that Mike D'Antoni has had, he has definitely made the most out of those situations with them. I mean, not only are you talking about Steve Nash and James Harden, two of the better passers of their generation even before they got Mike D'Antoni, but then you throw in players like Raymond Felton or Jeremy Lin, who looked like a legitimate all-star before Melo came and ruined it all. And at a certain point, you just have to acknowledge that Mike D'Antoni knows 
just how to make certain guys look better than they actually are. But I also think that in the case of someone like Steve Nash or James Harden, as I mentioned earlier, you have to look at what they were before Mike D'Antoni and after. And because obviously this is about Steve Nash, we're going to focus on his career and not Harden's. Nash, before he got D'Antoni, was already recognized and seen as one of the best offensive players in the league, primarily because of his scoring ability and playmaking. He was already one of the best passers that the league had ever seen when he was teaming alongside Dirk Nowinski in Dallas. Obviously, the first three to four years of his career, he got off to a bit of a slow start. He wasn't even a double digit scorer. But by 2002, Nash had already improved to being one of the better point guards in the league, averaging 18 points a game along with eight assists and three rebounds, shooting 48% from the field, nearly 46% from three on over four attempts a game, and 89% at the free throw line. But it's not just about the numbers that he put up in the box score. If you just go and watch the games, he was helping everybody get better and play at their best. As though Nash was not an all-star that season, Dirk had made his first all-star selection. As Dirk that season saw career highs in his points per game, field goal percentage, and three-point percentage that year, and the Mavericks jumped from being one of the better offenses in the league to being the best offense in the NBA by a noticeable margin. Going from an offensive rating that was fourth in the league of 107 to, like I said earlier, being first with 112. That was the impact of Steve Nash in his first season as a legitimate all-star caliber player. In 03, the Mavericks still remained as the best offense in the league, and Steve Nash was not only an all-star for the first time, but he also made third-team All-NBA. Nash's court vision and passing, along with Dirk's ability to space the floor and play in the post as well, was something that was spectacular. You really had two players that fit like a glove offensively, and though defensively was definitely something that needed to be worked on a little bit, offensively, they were something that we had never seen before. And it's very easy to pile on Steve Nash for his inability to win a championship with Dirk in Dallas and throughout his whole career, to be quite honest with you. But as many people have said, you do need luck to some degree to win championships. And luck was not on their side in 2003. Because after being the best offense in the league, as I said earlier, and winning 60 games in the process of that regular season, they would eventually reach the Western Conference Finals and Dirk Nowinski went down with a knee injury in game three. He would later miss the remainder of the series and the rest was history as the Spurs went on to win in six games and eventually the NBA championship. And sure, maybe the Mavericks would have lost anyways, but they were only down 1-2 at the time. There's no guarantee that the Mavericks would have lost that series, but there's no denying that Dirk's injury immediately ruled them out of that contention. Now in 2004, Steve Nash definitely underperformed in the playoffs, but I think that that three-year stretch from 2002, 2003, and 2004, it goes to show you just how impactful Steve Nash was on a team that already had a great offensive player, but once you added one of the best playmakers of all time already in the middle of his prime to that team, they not only jumped to the best offense in the NBA, but for three years straight, they're on top of the NBA as the best offense, and they're reaching record-setting numbers as a team offense. As the Mavericks in that three-year stretch was the best run of offense in NBA history. As relative to the league's efficiency, they were plus seven in that time period. No other team in NBA history has been able to accomplish that. Now, I know some of you people may be saying, oh, but that's not all on Steve Nash. Look at what Dirk was able to do. Okay, well, how do you explain that the second best team to have that kind of efficiency below the Mavericks is the Suns with Steve Nash in the stretch from 05 to 08? Because now that we have debunked this theory that Mike D'Antoni is just solely responsible for making Steve Nash a Hall of Famer, let's now talk about those years that are just so controversial to people and why Steve Nash was the rightful winner of those MVPs. Because for starters, when you look at the Phoenix Suns roster, please tell me the other great playmakers they had in that time period. I mean, the best answer you could probably think of is like Boris Diaw or maybe Joe Johnson. And look, Boris Diaw is pretty underrated in his own right, but the Suns as a team were already reaching all-time great offensive production before Boris Diaw joined in 2006. They did it in 05 as well. Because in 2004, the year before Steve Nash got there, when he was already helping lead the Mavericks to one of the better offenses in the league, the Suns were not only 29 and 53 to end off the season, but they were the 11th best team in points per game and 21st in offensive rating. And by the way, that was also with Mike D'Antoni as the head coach for a majority of the season going 21 and 40 in the process. But then the next year with Steve Nash joining the 
fray, they immediately jumped to not only a 62 win team, but was first in points per game and first in offensive rating. Sean Marion had the most efficient season of his life to that point, going from 51% true shooting the year prior to nearly 56 in 05. Amari Stoudemire as well had the most efficient season of his career to that point, going from a 53% true shooting career in 03 and 04, to then in his third season when he gets Steve Nash to initiate offense as one of the best pick and roll duos in the league, Amari Stoudemire had a 62% true shooting percentage. Hell, even Joe Johnson, who couldn't even crack 50% true shooting before Steve Nash got there. His first season with Steve Nash, it's nearly 56% true shooting. I mean, at a certain point in time, the facts just support that everywhere Steve Nash goes, he's making the people around him better. Nash was able to make reads in any way imaginable. In the pick and roll, he's one of the best PNR players in the history of basketball. Can split the screens, can use the roll man effectively, can find guys off of skip passes, is good in transition as well. And when you combine that with his ability to be efficient everywhere on the court, at the rim, from the mid-range area, from behind the arc, inside the arc, at the free throw line. And before some of you guys try to dismiss what Steve Nash did as far as his playmaking goes by saying, oh, he was just ball dominant. It's the same stuff that James Harden and Trey Young do. Well, I would say that is also incorrect. Nash was an elite off ball player, primarily due to his ability to shoot. He could come off pin downs, off ball screens, and even had a little bit of gravity off the ball as well to create for others. I mean, I'm not calling him Steph Curry or Damian Lillard, but the guy could shoot off the catch. I mean, the guy could shoot everywhere on the court in any way, shape or form. So it's not surprising that off the ball, he was so impactful as well. His ability to play off the ball helped all the offenses that he was a part of, whether he was in Dallas or in Phoenix. Nash was truly a joy to watch offensively, and he carried that over not only in the 2005 season, his first year there, but in 2006 as well. As with Amari Stoudemire only playing three games that whole regular season, Steve Nash did what only Steve Nash could do. Carry a team with only one all-star beside him and Sean Marion, elevate him to a career year of 22 and 13 on a career high true shooting percentage of 59%, while in Nash's own right, average 18 points a game, 11 assists, four rebounds, shooting 51% from the field, 44% from three on four attempts a game, and 92% at the free throw line. Nash still lifted the Phoenix Suns to 54 wins and finished second in offensive rating and first in points per game. I mean, it really is crazy that people overlook what the actual definition of MVP is for their own convenience. I mean, Nash showed in every single way imaginable offensively that he was the most impactful player for that team and throughout the league. I mean, I personally believe that in 2007, you could even still make the argument that Nash was actually robbed of an MVP that year. As Nash had his best offensive season to date, in my opinion, averaging 19 points and 12 assists on 65% true shooting, while leading the Suns to their second in three year span 60 plus win season, and of course, finishing a top of the league in points per game and offensive rating. Now, remember what I said earlier, so many people are going to say, what about the playoffs? Why is it with all this talent on the team, guys like Joe Johnson, Amari Stoudemire, Boris Diaw, despite the fact that Nash made them better, why couldn't he make them good enough for them to at least make one NBA Finals in that time span? Well, there are two things I have to say about that. For one, Nash in the playoffs with the Phoenix Suns led them to probably the best playoff offense in the history of basketball. The best four-year playoff offense is held by Nash's Suns, who were plus 10.7 in 51 playoff games between 05 and 08. And remember, as I said earlier, his Dallas teams were also top 10 as well. And a lot of this happened with lineup shifts all around. As I mentioned earlier, Amari Stoudemire basically missed the entire 2006 season, only playing three games in the regular season. And Joe Johnson left after the 2005 year. So Nash being able to do this with different lineups almost every single season only makes it that much more impressive. I mean, as you can see from this graphic right here, shout out to Be More Talks Basketball on Twitter for it. The Suns at their peak in 2005 were the best offensive postseason in the history of basketball. And this graphic also includes the 2010 NBA season in which they finished off that year being first in offensive rating and first in points per game. And they did that without Mike D'Antoni, by the way. And come playoff time, they finished with a plus 13 in relative offensive rating. Now, the second reason, in my opinion, why they did not make even one NBA Finals in this time stretch also comes down to bad luck. As I mentioned earlier, there were times 
times in Steve Nash's career where he probably should have made an NBA Finals, but unfortunately injuries, suspensions, all of those things came into play. As you can look at the 2006 Western Conference Finals losing to the Dallas Mavericks in six games, they went throughout not only that whole postseason, but as I mentioned earlier, the whole year basically without Amari Stoudemire. Who knows what the outcome of that year and that series would have been had they had Amari that whole entire time. Then you look at what happens the next year in 2006, and I'm not gonna lie, this still aggravates me to this day. Throughout the whole series, players like Bruce Bowen, Manu Ginobili, they are just being extremely dirty and physical with Steve Nash. And then on one play, while Steve Nash gets the rebound trying to go up court, Robert Ory basically body checks Steve Nash out of bounds. And because Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw stand up and walk away from the bench, just in an attempt to check on their teammate and stand up for him after he was done dirty, the league decides to dispend two of the Suns' best players as they're going back home with the series tied 2-2 when they have home court advantage and they proceed to lose game five and obviously game six as well. I am so convinced in my heart of hearts, even though you could say it's an agenda for me to push this video, but hey, I believe if that altercation never took place that the Suns would have won that series. And there's a good chance they beat the Dallas Mavericks in the conference finals and go on to win the championship against the Miami Heat. I mean, it truly is remarkable the things that Steve Nash had to go through in Dallas and multiple times in Phoenix that one can make the argument if those things never happened that he would be a three-time champion right now. But as many people have said, not only do you need the ability, the coaching, but you do need a little bit of luck sometimes to win any championship in professional sports. And unfortunately, more times than not, Steve Nash just did not have the luck of the Irish on his side. Now, I would be remiss if I went through this whole video gassing up Steve Nash and not acknowledging the times that Steve Nash did underperform or his inabilities. You can look at a series such as 2004 against the Dallas Mavericks, where Nash, who is known as one of the most efficient players in the history of the league, shot below 40% from the field throughout the entire series. They would go on to lose to the Sacramento Kings in the first round in five games. Another issue about Nash in his career that obviously has plagued him is his inabilities on the defensive side of the ball. As you guys saw, I talked about a lot of what he impacted offensively, but I did not talk much about his defensive impact. And that's obviously by design. Nash on the defensive side of the ball was a liability. I mean, he showed effort, so it wasn't like he was just out there not trying, but unfortunately, he just was not good at any particular thing. His size off rip made him a target for multiple players on ball. Off the ball at times, he could get caught ball watching and his rotations could be a little bit late. But the one thing I will say about Steve Nash's defense is that I think it gets over romanticized just how bad of a defender he is. And it's not because he isn't a bad defender, but it's because he's a point guard. Guards are so limited with their overall defensive impact for a team. You can really hide how bad a point guard is or any guard in general of that size when you give him the pieces around him that can mask those problems. But unfortunately, throughout Steve Nash's career, he was never really given great defenders on the interior. I mean, he played a good chunk of his career with two players who were not known for the defensive exploits, and it was quite the opposite, players like Dirk Nowitzki and Amari Stoudemire, especially Amari Stoudemire, who was just god awful on that side of the ball. Don't get me wrong, I give credit to players like Raja Bell and Sean Marion, but they're not elite rim protectors, which could have came in real handy for a guy like Steve Nash. For comparison, look at Steph Curry, who was never known as a great defensive player. Not saying he was as bad as Nash, but his defense is a part of his weaknesses. He was fortunate to play with somebody like Draymond Green for a good chunk of his career. Hell, even throwing guys like Andrew Bogut or Kevon Looney. Nash never really had that luxury for someone on the interior to do what someone like Draymond does for Steph. Another issue though that I do have with Steve Nash that many people don't talk about enough is his unwillingness at times to be aggressive. I mean, Nash has even said it himself that there were a lot of times he should have shot the ball a lot more. Because when you look at some of these postseason numbers for Steve Nash, he could have taken over these series and playoffs as a whole a lot more than he actually did. This is a guy that can literally score everywhere on the court in any way, shape, or form. There's no reason why Nash can't go out there every single year in postseason and average around 20 to 25 points a game along with 10 to 12 assists. That's how elite of a score he is. And if you disagree, then I suggest you go back and watch his 2005 postseason run. As he averaged 24 points a game, 11 assists and five rebounds, shooting 52% from the field, 39% from three on four attempts, and 92% at the free throw 
Battle Line. And if you want something more concrete, you can look at his run from 2002 up until 2010 with the Mavs and the Suns in the playoffs. As his per 75 in the playoffs in that time span was 21 points a game, 4 rebounds, and nearly 11 assists. With less than 4 turnovers per contest, the Mavs and Suns had a plus 8.7 relative offensive rating combined, and he had a true shooting percentage of nearly 62%, which was 5% better than the average in the NBA. Nash, when he wanted to, could take over a game on an instant. It really is a shame that he didn't activate that mode a lot more times than he did. Because if so, I definitely do believe that Steve Nash would have been remembered a lot more fondly on the offensive side of the ball. Because there are people that will literally swear to you that Steve Nash is not among the five best offensive players that basketball history has ever seen. Because when you combine the fact that his scoring ability is second to very few players in this league, with the ability to score everywhere on the court as efficiently as anybody ever in the history of basketball, with his passing being second to only Magic Johnson in my personal opinion, yes I do believe he's the second best passer of all time, combined with the regular stats, advanced stats, and every type of stat you could pull up to prove it, and that he revolutionized the point guard position as a whole, I have to say him being a top 5 player on the offensive side of the ball, that's a no brainer in my book. And the fact that you have people going out there saying he's one of the most overrated players of all time, he never deserved any of his MVPs, when in reality it's quite the opposite that he's one of the most underrated players of all time and you could argue he should have 3 straight MVPs from 05, 06, and 07, it makes me believe that Steve Nash is one of the most disrespected players in the history of basketball, hence why I made this video. But hey you guys, those are just my thoughts and opinions, I want to know what you guys think down below about Steve Nash. As the question of the day is, where do you rank Steve Nash among offensive players in NBA history and among point guards all time? I want to know what you guys think, comment down below, I will be reading and responding to as many comments as possible. This is your boy Young Muster signing out, you guys stay safe and have a blessed day, peace.